I think it will be better if you can share the session in German. <laughs> no, it's not better. <laughs> but okay, I think can... it's a five part. Yeah, yeah, it's time already. Yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. sure. oh. Then we can start. Uh, yeah, yeah, sure. I warmly welcome Professor Michael Rathien, professor at the School of Mathematics, University of Leeds. And he has interest in a special interest in proof theory, intuitionism, and constructive mathematics, set theory, uh, and also philosophy of mathematics. Uh, yesterday, we have uh, attended uh, the, his first talk where he started with the criteria for choosing intuitionistic uh, theories. And also he introduced the develop how, how intuitionistic logic developed. Uh, he talked about the concept of potential and uh, actual infinity, truth in mathematics. Uh, and uh, today we are also eager to listen to him, uh, his uh, uh, discovery or whatever what he wants to share with us, his own ideas. Uh, Professor Ratjen, please. Yeah, thank you very much for the introduction. Uh, uh, hello, um, Manindra. Mm. Uh, yes, yes, Manindra, sir. Yeah. Um, uh, Yesterday, we didn't have enough time to, for discussion. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, uh, will you permit to, st I mean, depends on, of course, the speaker. Mm, if I ask uh, one or two questions, which I asked yesterday, mm -hmm. uh, um, will that be too, <laughs> too, too difficult to accommodate? Um. And, you can start I, with that in that case. I, uh, it's better to ask Prof, Professor Ratjin uh, what he wants to do. If he wants to respond to the question, then uh, he's welcome. Uh, um, in in fact, part, I had two questions, which you think whether you will start with them or not. What number question one, what is the def, what will be the definition of a function uh, in uh, uh, in uh, uh, in this uh, intuitionistic context, which makes it possible to make every number theoretic function computable. This is one. And uh, number two is, is there any theory of truth? I mean, at all, whether truth uh, uh, has got any meaning uh, in intuitionistic mathematics. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, I mean, we know that probability is there, definitely. And yeah. uh, uh, for completeness results, we, we on one side we have truth and on the other side we have proof. So uh, matching between truth and proof is there. So in, in intuitionistic logic, my question is whether there is any kind of uh, any notion of truth at all in the intuitionistic context. So yes. these are the two points you can answer later also, but these two questions I wanted to ask yesterday. Yeah, good, good questions. Um, actually, there may be some of the questions or uh, some parts, some will be addressed when I, um, in the stuff that I'm going to talk about uh, today, but I will keep these uh, questions in mind. And so I will, I will, I think I will try to leave some time at the end so that, I can address the questions. Okay, uh, okay. Fine. okay, so maybe just start today. We continue, we don't start, we continue with yesterday's approach to uh, intuitionistic logic. And so th th this is called the usual, usually called the uh, Brouwer Heiting Kolmogorov interpretation. And it's supposed to give you an, an intuitive access to what. Intuitionistic logic means when you when you practice intuitionistic mat, uh, logic while doing mathematics, and um, there is um, yeah you're right actually you're quite right that, about the notion of function. What does what does function mean here in the Brouwer Heiting Kolmogorov interpretation? It's actually left implicit, or rather it's a it's a primitive notion, and it can be um, it can be manifested or embodied in, in many different ways. And I will get to that uh, when I come to realizability. Okay, so, uh, so there was a lot, of con a lot of questions and a lot of confusion yesterday. So let me just mention that you can also, of course, just uh, avoid the BHK interpretation, just say 
what are the formal rules? Yeah. And um, okay. What are the formal rules? And uh, so um, I'm, I'm assuming that you know some of these uh, deduction systems, formal proof systems. So one of them is what's called natural deduction, right? And um, in, if you take the natural deduction system for classical logic, but you need to have a system, a, a system of rules for all the connectors, not because in if you if you don't have excluded middle, then uh, the connectors are not interdefinable. That means that and or implication they are independent. You cannot define either in terms of the others. Okay, and so. Uh, the crucial rule you will have to drop when going from classical to intuitionistic and natural deduction style is this rule here, right? That um, so you have you you have this assumption negation phi, and then from that you deduce falsum. Falsum is just stands for a contradiction, and then you can uh, then you can infer phi. So in other words, it's basically uh, the same as saying if I if I can deduce the double negation of phi, then I can conclude phi. And this is the rule that is outlawed. That's taboo in intuitionistic logic. On the other hand, one still has uh, the what's called the intuitionistic absurdity rule, which says that if you manage to deduce a uh, falsum to a prediction, then anything, any other formula follows from that. Ex falso quod libet is the traditional name for that. Okay, so that, that's the main change. You have to you have to ditch this classical falsum rule or the double negation elimination rule, and then the other uh, rules uh, stay the same. But as I said before, every connective has to play a role here because they are not defined and definable. In, in terms of each other, yeah. So you have to you have to have rules, and you know they are in the natural deduction style. They are um, nicely separated into introduction and elimination rules, and you have to have them for for all these connectors. So the first uh, bunch is for conjunction, and uh, then the next bunch is for implication. But that's this this is no different to the classical uh, natural deduction style calculus. And then you have. Uh, Thirdly, you have uh, introduction and elimination rules for the disjunction. And then the same thing um, also for the quantifiers. They are not interdefinable. So you need a, a rules for the universal quantifier as well as for the existential. Okay, so that's, that's, that's the main thing. So it's, it's really, if you have the full natural reduction style and you just drop the double negation elimination rule, then you get intuitionistic logic. And, and another way of doing this is, of course, is, is a Hilbert style system where you have, uh, which is more um, arranged towards axioms. So you have a bunch of axioms and, and very few rules. And so in the Hilbert style system, um, for instance, um, you can do it in this way here. And then this, this rule of uh, ex falso quod libet is basically is covered by um, A10, yeah? Because it says if you have phi and not phi, that's basically a contradiction, then you, then you can uh, get anything, psi, okay? All right, so this, um, yeah. And then the few rules you need in the case of the Hilbert style system is just modern components and the introduction of a universal quantifier and the introduction rule for an existential quantifier. The universal quantifier introduces uh, a un um, the universal quantifier rule introduces a universal quantifier in the antecedent of an implication, whereas the, the existential introduction rule introduces an existential quantifier in the antecedent uh, of an implication. And of course, you have to um, you have to have have to obey the the usual uh, variable rule that the x is is not to occur and so on. Okay, so now uh, so this is also was about uh, just about intuitionistic logic, but really I wanted to talk about intuitionistic set theory, and that's um, the next topic.
Okay. Right. So um, we know many, many interesting formal theories, like, for instance, uh, first order number theory, which is usually called piano arithmetic. And uh, the intuitionistic version is called uh, Heiting arithmetic. And the difference between PA and HA, so these are the abbreviations for piano arithmetic and Heiting arithmetic, the difference is just the underlying logic. So basically the axioms stay the same, yeah, but the logic is um, not the same, yeah. You just uh, change the underlying logic. And well, this kind of simple idea you could also try to apply just to standard set theory, some Melo Frankel set theory. Yeah. And okay, that that's that's was kind of one of the first uh, moves just to change the underlying logic of set theory. Uh, ZF set theory. Okay. And okay, you can do this. And then you would have basically the same axioms. Well, let's see whether they are really the same axioms. You would have extensionality saying, well, two thirds are the same if they happen to have uh, the same elements. And then you have the usual axioms in set theory. You have pairing, union. You have the infinity axiom stating in some way that there is, a, that there is an infinite set. Uh, you would have full separation, meaning that if you have a formula phi x, say, and you have a given set A, then you can carve out a new set consisting of all those elements x from the given set A that satisfy the formula phi, yeah, full separation. And you have power set, uh, meaning that if you have a set, then also the collection of all subsets of that set uh, form a set. And well, instead of replacement, uh, you have actually a, a stronger form. So replacement is the difference between replacement and collection is that uh, in replacement, you would have to have in the antecedent of, so this read this as an implication here. In the antecedent, you would have for all X in A, there is exactly one Y, phi X, Y, and then you can find a set that uh, contains uh, enough of these witnesses y, yeah? Uh, and collection is the, is the strengthening because the antecedent becomes weaker. You do not require for all x and a, there is exactly one y, okay? And then, okay, well, the other axioms of ZF, well, another axiom is the, the so-called foundation axiom, yeah? Foundation axiom, what does the foundation act? So let's recall what the foundation axiom uh, says. The foundation axiom says if you have a non empty set, um, then it contains an element. Let's call the, the, the non empty set A. Then A contains an element X so that A intersected X is empty. In other words, there is a set in it which, which doesn't have elements that belong to that set. Or another way of, I mean, in the presence of, of axiom of choice, it means basically the same as saying, you cannot have an infinite descending epsilon sequence where you have that, um, say you have A0 and then you have an A1, which is an element of A0. You have an uh, A2, which, which is an element of A1. You have an uh, A3, which is an element of A2 and so on. You cannot have, so basically the foundation axiom uh, tells you that, that you cannot have these infinitely descending epsilon chains, yeah? So why not taking that axiom in the intuitionistic version of ZF? Well, it turns out that the foundation axiom expressed in, in, the, in that form actually entails classical logic. So you basically, you would, uh, you would get classical logic back. Okay, so that you cannot do if you want to do something interesting. And instead, instead of the foundation axiom, which is, says somewhat something negative, you say something positive. 
And the rule of the foundation axiom in set theory is really that you have this kind of induction available. You have induction over sets in this form here. Namely, it means that you have an induction principle similar to the induction principle for natural numbers. But here, um, so you have a property phi, say, and this property phi uh, behaves in the following way. If you have a set A and all the elements of A have this property, then also A itself has this property. So if this antecedent is satisfied here, then you can conclude all sets have the property phi. Yeah. So this is the positive way of stating the foundation axiom. Okay. And then, uh, well, these are all the axioms of uh, the intuitionistic version of ZF. And it's usually um, addressed using the acronym IZF, where I stands for intuitionistic. Yeah. And it, it turns out this is an it's, it is an interesting theory and it has interesting properties. Yeah. So one interesting property, for instance, is if you, in this IZF, if you prove a disjunction, phi or psi, then IZF either proves phi or it proves psi or it proves both. Yeah. This is a property you do not have in classical uh, ZF. So remember that there are uh, statements that are independent of ZF, yeah? like the continuum hypothesis, right? And you certainly can prove in ZF, you can prove the disjunction, uh, the continuum hypothesis holds or the negation holds, yeah? But you wouldn't have this so-called disjunction property. From, from that, you cannot deduce that IZF deduces uh, CH or it deduces the negation of CH, where CH stands for the uh, continuum hypothesis. And it has many other interesting properties, yeah? Uh, on the other hand, um, in the title, I also said something about constructive set theory. And IZF is still is not constructive. It has these um, very strong principles, uh, among them full separation and power set. And constructivists wouldn't accept these axioms because yeah, constructivists would argue that they do not make sense if one has a growing universe, yeah? Okay, and therefore, constructivists were really interested in finding a set theory that is more germane to what they are doing. And in particular, it shouldn't have this outrageous proof theoretic strengths that IZF has, okay. Right, uh, are there any questions about IZF right now? Because I'm going now going from IZF to a to constructive Pamela Frankel set theory. Let me just see whether in the chat there was something. Uh, okay. No, I I have just one question here uh, about these two different. Uh, I mean, uh, the versions. I mean the collection and set induction, uh, are they also available in, uh, in, in the in, um, ZF? Yeah, they are available in ZF. You can deduce so them. Derive, derive this. So yeah, you, you, you would, um, to, to de deduce collection, you would need a foundation plus replacement. Um, okay. And then uh, set induction, yeah, you can deduce set induction from foundation. Yes, that's right. Yeah. Okay. They are available in ZF. Mm -hmm. these mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. There, there was a question, I see a question about infinity as we know it. Yeah, you basically, you can uh, um, express it in, in the way that we know it, but not in the negative way. You say there is a, you have to say there is a set I such that I is, contains something, so there's something in it, you have to always to say positive things, not say it's non, it's it's not empty, you say there's something in it, it's inhabited as the constructivists say it. And moreover, so uh, I contains an element say X, and moreover, for all Y, if Y is in I, then also Y union singleton Y is an I. So that, that would be a way of stating the infinity axiom. 
Uh, Which is yeah. basically the, the same as in the classical form. Uh, okay, then uh, is this question meaningful? I mean, um, the notion of infinity uh, here, uh, is it necessarily potential infinity? Um, no, in this case, it would be, um, no, um, well, it depends on certain things, but in, in this case, uh, a constructivist who works in IZF would accept the natural numbers as a completed infinite totality, yeah? So the, the difference is here. So there are some sets that are viewed as completed actual, infin actual infinity, yeah? But the entire set theoretic universe is not viewed as, a, as an infinite actual um, thing, right? Okay. Okay. All right. So that's that's so much about IZF. And now let's switch to a con more constructive version of set theory based on intuitionistic um, logic. Okay. I, I should also mention that yeah. So, so one one wonders what happened. How strong is IZF? And it turns out that actually it's of the same strengths as ZF because there's some form of double negation interpretation of ZF, so the classical theory, into the intuitionistic similar Frank theory. Okay. Now, Brouwer and, and other constructivists, they wouldn't, uh, they wouldn't accept these axioms of IZF. I mean, not, not all of them. And uh, so Brouwer also uh, worked on an intuitionistic set theory. He, when, when he, uh, he, he wrote uh, certain very important papers in 1918 and 1919. And, uh, and he called this theory he was working on the uh, Gründung der Mengenlehre, uh, unabhängig vom logischen Satz vom ausgeschlossenen Dritten, which means he want, it's a foundation of set theory independent or divested of the uh, principle of excluded middle. Yeah, so he, he really wanted to develop a set theory. And uh, so, and, and Brauer to some extent developed mathematics on an intuitionistic basis, uh, but many, many people were critical as to whether it's possible to, um, to develop large chunks of um, mathematics on the basis of intuitionistic set theory. And really the person who showed that this is possible to a very large extent, there uh, was uh, Eric Bishop. He published a famous book in 1967, where he showed that actually uh, uh, using constructive logic, you can, uh, and, and uh, set theory, you can actually develop a large part of ordinary mathematics. So this was, was really a very critical uh, development because after Brouwer basically, for a long time, there, there was no real progress in constructive mathematics. So this, this book by Bishop from 1967 was really a breakthrough. Okay. Now, uh, and the, this work, Bishop's uh, book really galvanized um, many logicians of a constructive bend because they were looking for a well. What, so Bishop worked very informally in some kind of set theory based on intuitionistic logic, but people, logicians really wanted to know what, what kind of set theory you need. What are the axioms of the set theory? Or uh, axioms of another form, which are maybe not set theoretic. And so several people worked on this. So Myhill, John Myhill uh, developed his constructive set theory. And at the same time, so everything is was something in the early seventies, um, Herr Martin Löw developed his intuitionistic type theory, which has become very important these days, also in computer science. And Saul Pfefferman um, developed his explicit mathematics. Okay. And all of these frameworks were supposed to be frameworks in which you can do Bishop style constructive mathematics. And there was also um, a fourth one uh, by Peter Axel. So Peter Axel. Um, was interested in connecting Martin Löw type theory and 
Myhill's constructive set theory. And so he, he, what, what he really did was he found an interpretation of constructive set theory in intuitionistic Martin Love type theory. And it turns out that this is a, gives, a, gives a very natural interpretation of set theory and type theory. And then he found that not only are John Myhill's axioms of CST are validated by this interpretation, but actually more axioms. And so this gave rise to what's called constructive Samuel Frankel uh, set theory. And then about, um, yeah, actually, it, it, it's a, this constructive Samuel Frankel set theory, I'm very fond of it. Actually, Peter Axel and I, we wrote a book and we should have published it 15 years ago. And so I'm trying to publish it this year. We'll see what happens. Um, okay, so just very briefly what Myhill did. Um, my, of course, uh, his constructive set theory is based on intuitionistic logic. Uh, he had an ontologically somewhat richer um, collection of objects not just sets, but he distinguished between numbers, sets, and functions. So they are all uh, have, have their own um, unicity. They have their, their own character, and, and they, they are not supposed to be defined in, in terms of the others. Uh, but that's not so important. And then he had accents like extensionality, pairing union, infinity, the usual stuff. But with separation, there is a difference. Separation has to be restricted. And uh, what does it mean? So you cannot just take a set A and a property phi, and then say uh, those elements U of A that satisfy phi U, uh, they form a set where phi uh, may be a formula that has unbounded uh, quantifiers. So uh, in my head, set theory only bounded separation is allowed. So in other words, all the quantifiers appearing in the formula phi have to be of the form for all X in Y, well, there is an X in Y. They have to be, be of this restricted form where the quantifiers are restricted and, and that the variables range over uh, a given set Y, okay? And then instead of power set, and that, that's a very crucial difference. In terms of power set, um, Maiho has an exponentiation axiom. And it says, if you have two sets A and B, uh, then the class of all functions from B to A forms a set. And this is something that um, classical set theorists are immediately kind of um, irritated about. And because, well, in classical logic, there's no difference between the axiom, exponentiation axiom and the power set axiom. Okay, so exponentiation says uh, given two sets, uh, then the collection of functions from one set to the other set uh, forms a set. Power set says, given a set, all the subsets form a set. And then with classical logic, you can see that these two axioms are equivalent. But intuitionistically, they are not. They are very, 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 very different. Yeah. The exponential is very, very different from power set. And the particular power set uh, provides you with enormous proof theoretic strengths. Exponentiation does not. But exponentiation is actually what you need for mathematics because you want to look at function spaces. And so uh, this, this is a very important distinction, the distinction between power set and function spaces. And this difference only plays out, just to repeat myself, when um, you argue intuitionistically. Classically, there's no difference. Okay. And then finally, one here, Michael has replacement. And he has the set induction scheme as we have seen it before. Yeah. But that's his theory. And you wonder how strong is this theory? Yeah. And it turns out it's, it's very, very weak. Yeah. And that's, that's kind of surprising because we saw in the other case, in the case of IZF, it's of the same strength as ZF. And so it would be subject to the same uh, worries and complaints and as uh, by constructivists as ZF. But with, with, with constructive set theory a la Mayo, it's totally different. Okay, and this is kind of surprising. Um, now, Peter Exel, when he um, engineered his interpretation of um, Mayo's constructive set theory and Martin Love type theory, he found out that many, many of the distinctions that Mayo um, 
introduce between sets, numbers, and functions is not really necessary. You can just uh, do the usual way of dealing with numbers and functions in, in, in ordinary set theory, right? So numbers are just the um, certain ordinals um, in, in omega. And, and functions are just relations between sets that, that have additional properties. Okay, and then so the uh, constructive central factor sector has these actions: functionality, pairing, union, again bounded separation, as as Myho had it. But instead of exponentiation, it actually has a as a, a still stronger axiom, which is um, which I do not want to explain really, but it's kind of a mysterious axiom. It says, uh, given two sets A and B. It's not only the case that the collection of all functions from B to A forms a set, but you can actually also have a multi-valued functions. So there's a sufficiently large set of multi-valued functions from, from A to B. And the multi-valued Im imply the single-valued function uh, and entail the single-valued function. So this is, I do not want, this is a mysterious axiom, but I, I do not want to, um, to go into detail. So for, for this talk, Basically, the subset collection axiom, you can take it just to be Myhill's exponentiation. Okay. And then instead of Myhill's replacement, it has an even stronger collection form. Why stronger? Well, you see, this is, a, this is an implication. Yeah. And so we have the same uh, antecedent as in the case of collection. We have for all x in a given set A, there is a y, phi x, y. And then the conclusion is you, you find a set B. The set B consists of witnesses for these Ys. Yeah? So meaning for all X and A, there's a Y in B, phi X, Y. So that's the same, that's the same as collection. Yeah? But then uh, in an intuitionistic, in a, or rather in a constructive context where we don't have full separation, this set B could contain a lot of, a lot of garbage. Namely, it could contain tons of sets Z that have nothing to do with anything in X and A, right? So, and uh, we want to get rid of the garbage and you can get rid of the garbage if you have full separation, but we don't. And so the strong collection axiom has, in the antecedent has another uh, conjunct, the second part here, which says everything in B is not garbage. So everything in B is related to an X and A via phi X one, yeah, okay. So these are the, the full axioms of constructive Samuel Franco uh, set theory. Okay. Okay. Good. And now it turns out that in this um, Samuel Franco, constructive Samuel Franco set theory, you can develop Bishop style mathematics and, and much, much more. And it's very it's a very nice um, set theory for doing constructive mathematics. Um, you might wonder how strong is this theory from a proof theoretic point of view? What is this consistency strength? And 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 I will say a little bit about this later. Okay. Um, right. So let me just watch the time here. Okay, we're still oh, okay. That's good. Not too bad. By the way, the book on constructive set theory, it's available on, on my webpage, um, a book draft. Okay. So now about the strengths of theories. Um, May I ask one question here? Okay. Just the previous slide, yeah. Okay. Uh, in, in CZF, um, uh, these are the uh, set axioms, but what, is the underlying logic here, logic axioms? The underlying logic is intuitionistic logic. Okay. okay. Yeah. Okay, that's a good remark, actually. Um, well, you might wonder what happens if I change the logic back. So the, the underlying logic of CZF is intuitionistic logic, so just to iterate. What happens if I change the logic? I make it classical logic. Any, do you have any guess what happens? <laughs> no guess. Uh, will, will, will it be equivalent to ZF? Yeah, that's right. That's the right answer. It will yeah. be, you're back to ZF, really. But really, the difference is 
the, the, the underlying, changing the underlying logic makes a huge difference, yeah? You saw in the case of IZF, IZF is of the same strength as ZF. With CZF, it's the, if with classical logic is of the same strength as ZF, but with intuitionistic logic, it's much, 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 much weaker. Yeah? So it's a really a crucial difference here. And of course, the axiom, how the axioms are shaped, the particular form of the axiom is also very important. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay, but we, we will not have time today to see how this, how you do mathematics in such a system and how it plays out. Yeah, um, yeah. That, that would require an entire course in constructive set theory. Okay, so uh, just to give you an idea of the strengths of CZF, so classically it's, it's really very strong, but intrinsically it makes a difference. There's something uh, by some people in logic, it's called, or it's, it's usually known as the Gödel hierarchy. So it's a hierarchy of formal systems in which one can develop mathematics. And basically you make ever stronger um, assumptions, set theoretic assumptions. And at the very low end, we have the so-called, well, some people call it finitistic theories because uh, they, are, they can be equated with Hilbert's finitism. And, and these are systems, um, so the PRA at the very bottom stands for primitive recursive arithmetic. So it's, it's a, a very weak subsystem of piano arithmetic. Yeah. And then there are several systems that were distinguished in a program it's called reverse mathematics. So reverse mathematics is basically looking at um, theorems in ordinary mathematics and wants to know what, you, what do you really need to prove these? Theorem. So what kind of set existence actions are required? And also the, this program was actually begun much, much earlier, I, not under this name. Uh, it, actually, Hermann Weyl started it really in 1918 with his book, Das Continuum, where, where he developed um, analysis from a constructive intuitionistic point of view. And then it was also pursued by Hilbert and Bernays and, and other people. But then it became known as reverse mathematics um, um, under the, um, yeah, where basically when Harvey Friedman and Steve Simpson um, turned it into a program. Okay, so these, these are very weak systems here at the bottom, right? And then in reverse mathematics, one considers um, more systems, stronger systems, so so-called predicative systems. And, um, yeah, ACA zero stands for arithmetical comprehension and so on. And then there's also systems called generalized predicative systems where you're, where you're allowed to do inductive definitions. And uh, there you can get quite a lot of proof strengths out of generalized inductive definitions. So Martin Love type theory, for instance, is a, is, a, is a theory where you can do inductive definitions. And you see CZF is here. CZF is, is, very, is the very bottom of this uh, hierarchy of generalized predicative theories. So CZF is here. That's quite weak. You know? uh, and well, then the Gödel hierarchy, of course, um, in, in set theory continues. And well, before we come to set theory, we have things like second formal second order arithmetic. And you get uh, much, much stronger systems than uh, CZF, so you have where you have all uh, where you have unrestricted comprehension, and then at the so this is the medium range. But when it we come to the strong range, it's where you go to Samelo set theory. So the difference between Samelo set theory and um, Samelo Franco set theory is the replacement. Of, yeah, uh, and so uh, Samelo set theory is, is very very strong. And for instance, it's it, but it corresponds to something like um, yeah, it, it's related to basically uh, the constructive version of it is related to Topos theory. Basically, this, this Topoi one looks at in Topos theory, they are somewhat models in a certain sense of intuitionistic Semelo set theory. Semelo set theory, not the Frankel thing. Frankel thing is about uh, is having a replacement in addition. And Semelo uh, set theory is only restricted in, in, in terms of height. You can only get to an old it can get only to the ordinal omega plus n, but not to omega plus omega. 
in, in the von Neumann hierarchy, yeah. Okay. And then these days, of course, set theorists uh, go much further. So there were these, uh, so Samuel Frankel's set theory here is on this slide is at, is at the bottom. But then set theory is con uh, already, um, they're already in the beginning of the 20th century. Hausdorff actually considered the notion of an inaccessible cardinal. And Marlowe, also a German set theory, considered Marlowe cardinals in 19. 11, and, but then Ceteris, after the Second World War, they went, they invented new notions of large cardinals. And these days, people are dealing with extremely strong cardinals, measurable cardinals, and so on, and even stronger ones, huge, and nowadays even Berkeley cardinals. The Berkeley cardinals here, by the way, have this property that they're inconsistent in the presence of the axiom of choice. Yeah. Whereas we don't know whether the other cardinals, like measurable, super compact, and huge, are inconsistent in the, the presence. Are, are the Berkeley cardinals connected with Udin? They are what? Uh, the, are the are the Berkeley cardinals connected with Udin? Yeah, they. they I mean, they. Mm, I think they get the name from Berkeley, from the um, not from the bishop, I think, but I'm not totally sure about this. But they they, they are now considered by some set of like Wooden and, mm -hmm. and Kerner and uh, Bagaria. They they are looking at these cardinals uh, mm -hmm. because we we know that uh, you the there's a so-called Reinhardt cardinal, which was suggested in the late '60s, was just doing something quite intuitively plausible. Let me say, okay, there should be an elementary embedding of the set theoretic universe into itself. But then shortly after the Reinhardt proposed the uh, this axiom, Kunin showed that it's inconsistent in the presence of the axiom of choice. Yeah. But it's not known, if you don't have the axiom of choice, whether these notions are inconsistent. And then recently, um, set theories have gone above, beyond um, Reinhardt cardinals, and now they have Berkeley cardinals and, and, and more. Okay, so this so, you, so this is basically the the, the so-called Gödel hierarchy, and um, and just to give you an idea, so it means that the Caesar F is 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 a rather weak theory considered um, when when you have the full Gödel hierarchy seen before. Okay, all right, so um, right. Um, okay, so um, this is not the place, definitely not today, to, to start developing mathematics in CZF. But I was just give you one homework. Um, and you know the Russell paradox, right? And so the Russell paradox, and that's the homework, can also be proved in CZF on the basis of intuitionistic uh, logic. Um, that's not difficult. But I'm just pointing, I, I'm just giving you this as an exercise because very often in most, in most texts, if you open a text on set theory, usually people do a case distinction to prove Russell's paradox. And, that, um, and um, you might get the impression, since it's in almost all books, they do a case distinction. It has to be done via a case distinction. Now, the problem with intuitionistic logic is you cannot do case distinctions. You cannot say either this is the case and I do something in that case, or it's not the case. And I do another argument for the not case, right? And this is an argument which ex is based on excluded middle, right? You cannot do that. So the thing is, doing this case distinction is totally unnecessary. You can do Brussels paradox with intuitionistic logic, and that's the homework. Okay. Uh, and now, um, in, in yesterday, when I gave you some kind of, um, list with nice things that happen if you study intuitionistic set theories. Uh, one of these things was that you can create mathematical worlds or set theoretic worlds in which phenomena can happen and can live, which are impossible if you uh, employ classical logic. Yeah? And uh, okay, I would like to give you some ideas of what kind of how you construct models of all kinds of you know, phenomena uh, for intuitionistic set theories. And um, you know, um, 
many ways of constructing models, different models for classical set theories. And uh, so, for instance, we have the, the uh, Gödel started with the Gödel, the constructible hierarchy, and the constructible hierarchy is, is, is an inner model, actually the smallest inner model of similar Frankel set theory. And in the constructible hierarchy, Gödel showed that um, the continuum hypothesis holds and, and other things. Yeah. And then, of course, there's a very important construction, uh, forcing, developed by Cohen in the early 60s. And it turns out that you can also use these uh, methods, both methods you can use in connection with intuitionistic set. So for instance, the Gödel constructible hierarchy can develop and can be developed in CZF. And you can also use, and you can also develop forcing within CZF, within constructive semilar Frankel set theory. So it's enough to do, uh, to do all the forcing constructions inside it, yeah. But there are many more tools available for constructing models of intuitionistic set theories. Um, I just mentioned this, this the formally as classes or formally as types interpretation. That, that is basically inspired by Martin Love type theory, how you interpret a set theory in Martin Love type theory. And that leads to interesting results, but I don't want to talk about that. But there's a very important tool in addition to forcing and so on available. And this is realizability interpretations. And there's no real counterpart to that in the classical set theoretic world. And I would like to talk a little bit about that. But then there are many other things like um, so a, a variant of forcing is basically is, is the Boolean valued approach developed by uh, Dana Scott and Bob Solovey. And in, for the intuitionistic uh, set theories, you can also do something similar, but instead of Boolean valued, you have heighting valued models. So you have heighting algebras instead of uh, Boolean algebras. And then there's lots of other interesting topological models, Kripke models, and uh, categorical models. I already said that in the category theory, you look at certain large and rich categories called topoi, and so on. So there's and, and there's also proof theoretic methods, of course. But today I would just like to talk a little bit about these realizability interpretations. Yeah. And uh, so this actually the first realizability realizability. Interpretation was done by Kleene. And the interesting thing is also about realizability interpretation. One immediately feels there should be a connection to the so called um, Brauer Heighting Kolmogorov interpretation of the logical connectors and quantifiers. Okay, so I will just uh, give, uh, show you a little bit about Kleene realizability. Let me just check for time. Okay, we have some minutes. Um, so I will write this E dot bullet or E bullet N for, I apply the E partial recursive function to N yeah, or the E Turing machine to N and then see whether it yields a result or not. Yeah. But that's, that's the meaning of this bullet here. And then I will write uh, some kind of pairing function. So E we have a pairing function on the natural numbers. Like this is just called L angle, right angle. It could be two to the n times three to the k, like, and then unpairing functions, where e zero gives you back the n and e one gives you back the k. So that's just a little bit of notation. And then, uh, how did Kleene define his realizability? And so this is realizability really for for number theory, for, for heighting arithmetic. So we just, so in heighting arithmetic, we just talk about numbers, quantifiers range over numbers, intuitionistic number theory. So if you have an atomic formula, uh, E realizes A, so I just call this, this symbol here realizes, the K just stands for cleaning to distinguish it from other forms of realizability. So for an atomic formula, realizability just means it's true. Yeah. And for a conjunction just means E realizes a conjunction if the first projection of E realizes the first conjunct, the second realizes the second conjunct. And interesting case is uh, in the case of a disjunction, E realizes a disjunction A or B if the first projection of E is zero and then the second projection is a realizer for A, or the first projection 
of E is, is not zero, and the second uh, projection realizes B. So again, you have this kind of if, if you have a realize if you realize a disjunction, you have to decide which part you realize, you know, which which of the disjuncts you realize. And then for implication, so, it's, so it's the, very the, the disjunction and conjunction are not commutative, right? No, they are not. Okay. Well, I mean, it's an intuitionistic logic. They are not interdefinable. Yeah. None of the connectives is definable in terms of the other connectives. Yeah. They, right. are, they are totally independent. Yeah. Okay. And then uh, just uh, to mention here the, the implication case. So in the Brouwer Height and Kolmogorov interpretation, the notion of function was left to be unexplained with some kind of intuitive notion or basic notion or primitive notion. But here in Kleene, um, in Kleene's realizability, it is said what the functions are. Namely, E is a realizer for an implication means that for every D, if D realizes A, then E of D realizes B. And what is E of D? Well, E of D means we apply the E's partial recursive function to D. It gives a result, yeah? The result is E bullet D, and that's a realizer for B. So in other words, the notion of function that Kleene uses in his realizability is the notion of um, partial recursive function, yeah? Or, or partially computable function. Okay. And then the realizer for a universal statement is, well, it basically it means E realizes the universal statement if E realizes E, so you apply E to N, and that's a realizer for Fn for each of these instances. And in the case of uh, existential quantifier, it's like also like in the brouwer heiting kolmogorov interpretation, namely E realizes an existential statement means that uh, the first projection of E provides the witness for the existential statement, and the second projection of E uh, is a realizer for F of E0. Yeah. Okay. And then, uh, so Kleene with this realizability showed that all the theorems of heighting arithmetic, the intuitionistic number theory, are realizable. Okay. And um, so I, I'm, I'm have, uh, I have to be short now. So, um, so Kleene uses basically um, an, an the um, partial recursive functions for as realizers, yeah? But you can use many, many other things as realizers. And, um, and this gives, gives, leads to the notion of a partial combinatorial algebra. And so it's, it's, it's a, a, a part, um, a partial algebra is just a, a set equipped with a binary partial um, operation called dot here. And then, uh, okay, and then you have a partial combinatorial algebra. And I, I'm not going to explain this notion, but it turns out that um, to do computations over an, a, a domain of objects, you only need um, this kind of PCA structure. And um, so basically, a, a partial combinatorial algebra is, 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 is a set equipped with an operation which allows you to do computations over this set M. And there are many, many, many um, partial combinatorial algebras and it's a very rich area of research. And there, there's so, so many, there's a plethora of partial combinatorial algebras. But anyway, uh, the, what you can do now and to cut these things short is you can do also realizability for set theory. And it's much, much more difficult to define it than in the case, in the, in the arithmetic case. And then what you can do, you can do it, you can do a, a, a realizability for any partial combinatorial algebra. And then it's very interesting to study how the world, this kind of realizability world um, behaves. And the particular, so first of all, um, all the axioms of IZF and of CZF are realized in any, uh, over any partial combinatorial algebra. But then differences between partial combinatorial algebras play an important role, like enforcing the, um, the combinatorial property of the notion of forcing um, has, a has a result on what is forced in addition to the usual axioms of ZF. Yeah? 
And here it is similar. So if you take, for instance, the Kleene algebra, so what Kleene used for, for his um, realizability interpretation, this algebra is usually called K1. And it turns out that if you do realizability of, over K1, then the set theoretic world you get is one that obeys the law of Russian constructivism, as it's sometimes called. In that, for instance, all the functions from n to n are computable. Yeah. And if you take K2, Kleene's second algebra, which is continuous function application. So here the underlying set is bare space for the collection of all functions from n to n. Then you get Brouwer's intuitionism in which all of his um, continuity principles are valid. Yeah. And you get many, many, many more interesting worlds, but I think in the interest of time, I, I should uh, stop here. So um, I think this is the end. So thank you very much for listening. <clears throat> Um, thank you, Professor Rakhien, uh, for a very informative and uh, thought-provoking talk. The paper is now open for discussion. Any criticism or any question, any comment is welcome. I just saw one um, comment or question in the chat. Uh, forcing without choice. You, you don't need uh, choice. There's no choice for forcing. I request the audience. Uh, if there is any, any other questions, there are some raised hands I can see mm. from Rumit and Shora. Oh, I can't see them. Anyhow, so Shora. Aramit. Okay, you can uh, proceed. Can okay. Yeah, of course. Okay. Uh, so thanks for the talk, Lakin. Uh, I would want to know perhaps like, so what happens to the definition of reals in the constructivist framework? Like, uh, do they lose some property that is known classically? Like for instance, completeness doesn't hold or something like that, or all the reals that are there in the, in the classical framework are the same as the reals uh, that, um, that one would yeah, construct. With, with the reals, um... So first of all, you can define the reals in, um, in this constructor set theory in, in different ways. You can do the, you can define, use the, the Cauchy definition of reals. Mm -hmm. uh, but there's also the Dedekind version of it. Right. Um, you have to add a little bit more than in the classical case. Uh, just to, um, so the Cauchy version, so this is basically how Bishop did it. So these are, converging um, sequences of rationals and they are rapidly converging. That's, that's an extra condition that Bishop added. And, uh, but then you can do analysis mostly in the usual way. There's also the notion of uh, constructive Dedekind reels. There you work with Dedekind cuts and you need an extra condition um, uh, to make this work. Um, there are some principles um, you have to give up on, but um, I should point out that Bishop, um, Bishop's book um, made a big splash and it was due to him being able to retrieve large parts of functional analysis. So he's, he's by, by training, he's a, he was a functional analyst, right? And he wanted to, of course, he wanted to salvage a lot of the interesting analysis, not just the basic, you know, basic analysis you learn in, in the calculus class, but, but really stuff that you need for the natural sciences, like Hilbert spaces and so on, spectral theorem and, and whatnot, yeah. Um, uh, but you lose some things, yes, you lose. So if it's, it's so if for instance, comparison of real numbers as to which one is greater than or equal to the other one, uh, that, that doesn't hold unrestricted. Yeah. You may not be able to decide this. <clears throat> okay, uh, so, uh, sorry. Uh, another question I had a little outside whatever you have spoken about. So, so, uh, so 
in the classical sense itself so when we do proofs and all now in place of existence we can also do this thing called probabilistic existence right so so what i meant to say is like existence sounds a little we a little more constructivist in some sense compared to the probabilistic uh, notion of uh, the existence of an element in in a particular set or something like that uh, so in the constructivist framework do does probability that kind of a probabilistic reasoning hold like that framework of proof uh, does it make sense over there it, like for me it I, it feels so my intuition is it doesn't it wouldn't work over there i just want a affirmation or uh, say like the opposite the negation of yeah i mean um, what has been okay so first of all what has been done constructively is probability theory in in czf right okay uh, so probability theory and um, what else and um, <clears throat> a large part of probability theory and game theory has been developed on the basis of czf um, well, if you're talking about um, having proper probabilistic quantifiers so where the existence is an existence to um, up to a certain certainty or and so on uh, i'm i'm not aware that this has been developed yeah okay but i think it should it, it should make a nice uh, investigation yeah i mean combining these two should be right. possible uh, uh, but it's no it has not been done i mean um i'm there's a bunch of other people i'm kind i'm currently um editing a, a handbook of constructive mathematics and in that book there are several chapters on probability theory from a um constructive point of view and um and maybe one one should look at these chapters and see whether something in your direction can be done but it's an interesting suggestion okay thank you thanks <clears throat> this discussion was really uh, insightful for me thank you Okay. Rob, do you want to say something? Yes, um, <clears throat> Rajan. Uh, thank you very much for this nice talk. It's uh, we 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 really enjoyed it. Okay, uh, my pleasure. One, just one question I have. Like uh, there are so many, but I just want to uh, ask you now. One is this that uh, we know that uh, everything which can be proved in IZF. can also be proved in zf right yes uh and from here we can say that ch is independent uh in yes. izf mm -hmm. as well yes so uh so my question is that that means to prove ch is independent that means we since ch is independent in zf and from uh, the previous result we can say that it is independent in izf but yeah. my point is that to that means to prove ch is independent in izf if i can construct two models of zf where in one ch holds and another one ch doesn't hold those mm. two models also work for izf as well right yes yeah to prove ch is independent but my question is yeah. does there exist two models of only izf but not of zf where in one sage holds and in another sage doesn't hold <clears throat> so you want to have a model where basically um you, um which is not a model of in, of classical logic yes yes of classical logic yes. to be a model of izf yes uh, say one with ch and the other was not ch yes yes yes, uh, yes. <clears throat> to prove um, the independence of ch in izf without taking the help of the classical set theory mm -hmm. um yeah that that can be done um it depends a bit on what else you want i mean um but um it can be done that that's yeah um If if I knew what you, if you just wanted to have such models, okay, mm -hmm. then it can be done. But do you have something more in mind? Do you want to do something with them? I mean, it depends on what you want to do with them. Um, um, no, actually, uh, the the I I'm asking the question in some other for some uh, other reason, like uh, mm -hmm. what we want to do with that 
that is not my goal but we uh, actually recently we worked on some paper where uh, we we showed some kind of a technique where uh, we are showing that suppose you are taking a sub collection of zf like a, a sub theory of zf mm -hmm. and we are we are we we made some technique from the existing technique of uh, of, of independence uh, showing results uh, which are independent from the set theory from did you use forcing have... or what did you use? Huh? Sorry. Did you use? Did, are you using forcing or what kind of methods do you use? Um, so actually, not directly using forcing, but we are taking the result that something is independent in ZF, and just mm -hmm. by from that result, we have made something so that we are making this kind of results that in the sub theory, we can give the model which are the models of the sub theory only, but not the the whole ZF, which mm -hmm. are showing yeah. the independence of the result. So okay. mm -hmm. that's the case. Like the independence is following hereditarily. That's true. But whether we can come up with models of the sub theory only, but okay. not the full theory. Okay. That's, that's, that's what I that's what I suspected that you want something more. So yeah. Yes. Okay. Yes. Exactly. Um, yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. I think uh, I would have to look at this because you have looked at this, so it shouldn't be obvious and <laughs> okay yes so, yes and of course, of yeah, course. Yes. yes yeah i i can share uh, the work with you and then we can discuss like uh, if right if you yeah will. that's a good idea yeah yeah uh, okay. thank you thank you very much thank you very much mm -hmm. <clears throat> um any more question or any more comment um um i am not sure um uh about the um uh, about the status of um Continuum hypothesis in in the constructive hierarchy. Will you please explain? I mean, uh, do they still? Uh, um, uh, I mean, what is the what is the status of continuum hypothesis in say, for example, in IZF? For in in classical in classical uh, set theory in ZF we. We we know that it is independent of the other axioms. Yeah. So is it so in uh, IZF also, or uh, mm -hmm. yeah? Hmm? Is this yeah, it the same? Hmm? Yeah. So so here also you have um, IZF with continuum hypothesis and without uh, IZF with negation of continuum hypothesis also as well. Is it so? Yeah. 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 Okay, and it is also the case for other constructive uh, um, uh, systems. The hierarchy. Yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah. All, all the independences from ZF then immediately uh, give you independence from IZF. Yeah. <clears throat> and and then this also, of course, uh, applies to CZF, which is a weaker theory. Yeah. <clears throat> mm -hmm. So one, any, um, can you just tell us, I mean, any of the, uh, any of the important results of uh, set theory, which we are not getting in IZF or on the other constructive hierarchies. I mean, other than the axioms. I mean, you have already mentioned the axioms. So I know uh, yeah, I mean, what was you in, in IZF? I mean, you you cannot, so for instance, cardinals is a problem, right? For cardinals, and because the, the ordinals are not linearly ordered, yeah? Mm -hmm. And uh, and saying, so the very classical move is always to say, okay, if something happens, it happens somewhere for the first time. And, and this kind of argument, this kind of reasoning doesn't work intuitionistically. So also the theory of cardinals doesn't um, doesn't look good from I, from an IZF point of view. Of course, you could say, okay, let's let's view everything negative. If you, if you apply enough negations and so on to your statements, then uh, you can have basically the world in a negative way. Also an IZF. Yeah. But I mean, uh, so so many so the whole notion of cardinal is not really very very useful on the basis of IZF. Mm -hmm. So yeah, so when this doesn't work, and <clears throat> uh, may I ask a question? 
Um, okay, you can proceed, but this is the last question because okay. we don't have any more time. Okay, I just wanted to ask, like, uh, we know the, uh, we already know the stuff, like the measurability of the project, if the project is sets, like Delta one to measurability certain kind, they are independent. Mm -hmm. Okay, from yeah. from the ordinary ZFC. <clears throat> How, however, the uh, are there situations like we can separate separate certain kinds of measure we keep, sorry we can separate certain kinds of measurabilities and certain kinds we cannot. For example, in the lever model, you of course have the Miller measurability Miller measurability, but not in the Miller model and so <laughs> on. Okay, now I am asking like. If we remove, uh, if we try to do such kinds of things in in uh, uh, these uh, in these situations, like in CZF or IZF, does it lead to more separation results or something like that? However, one problem might be like one problem might occur regarding the iterations, right? Because as you said, the ordinals do not behave so nicely mm. there. I mean, you get many, you get many separations already at a much lower level. Yeah, I think of notions of notions of so finite. You have to be careful in the intrinsic context. The notion of finite or subfinite or, su uh, or finitely enumerable, they are they are all different in this context. Yeah. So subfinite, for instance, means being so maybe finite means a set is finite if it's in one one correspondence with a natural number. Okay. But then. If you have a finite set in that sense and have a subset of it, you cannot show in IZF that it is in one one correspondence with a natural number. Yeah. So all, also, also, also already notions of finiteness, notions of countability and so on, they, they already um, fork into different directions. You have much finer scale, much finer distinctions on the intuitionistic part. Okay. Um, but but let me point out one thing, maybe. Um, so IZF was not particularly developed, or, or in this, or let's say CZF is not particularly developed to uh, what set theorists do. They, this is mostly a theory for doing mathematics constructively. Yeah. So the focus is not on on these very large notions. I mean, on, on cardinals and all this kind of stuff. So, um, but 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 what you made is a valid point. And many 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 notions become. Uh, separated. So you have a much fine, much more fine-grained distinctions on the basis of intuitionistic logic in set theory. Yeah. And uh, just uh, uh, as a very uh, short sorry. question, I just wanted to. No, ask sorry, you. sorry, sorry, sorry. It's too. Uh, we are already running short of time. Please, Good. please okay. ask later on. So okay. um, we have Maybe already. Maybe email. Big... Okay, we have already a very good interaction. So thanks again. Thank you again. Rathian for your talk and uh, now Thank we'll be you. having this, our second speaker today and uh, I think before that Purvita has something to say yeah uh, isn't it Purvita yeah 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 so thanks Professor Arjun and thanks Monika Di for chairing that session and actually we do have a couple of uh, announcements uh, before going to the next uh, session uh, that is the talk by Professor Amika uh, that is Chatterjee. So I want to request Professor Mohua Banerjee to announce. Uh, please, Professor Banerjee. Can you... Yeah, yeah, I am around. Can you yeah. hear me? Can you see me? Uh, uh, yeah, enable, we can see. Enable screen share. Uh, yes, yes, can... just a moment. I'm just trying to make it a co host. Then we... You can just enable screen share instead of uh, okay. Okay, whatever is coming. Yeah. Uh, now you can. Just, okay. Just... Yeah, sorry to intrude. <laughs> I've just come in for an advertisement break. So <laughs> this is <laughs> uh, this is uh, an announcement for the next edition. That's the tenth uh, in the series of uh, the Indian Conference on Logic and its Applications that we've been having now uh, for several years. So no, okay. this is going. To... You can hear me, right? And, and yeah, you can yeah, see yeah. the screen, right? Yes. Yeah. Uh, okay, so this would the, the next edition for an advertisement break. Oh, something is happening. I don't know. <laughs> there is an echo, I think.
you can hear it's me fine. clearly i've muted it it's fine now okay okay, okay. thanks okay uh, so uh, this uh, 10th edition of the icla as we call it uh, is going to happen next year so 2023 and uh, the venue um, if in i mean in case of course uh, the way things are going in the world we still do not know what the situation will be next year so there is a question mark about the uh, an organization being offline or in the hybrid mode or fully in the online mode so there are question marks out there but just in case it is in the offline or hybrid mode uh, we have the iit indoor um, um, colleagues step in um, so we have to thank them for uh, stepping in to host the and organize uh, uh, other things as well associated with the conference next year and the tentative schedule uh, that one has decided is the last week of february or the first week of march so sometime between that and uh, here are the committees so i have been uh, um, uh, i'll be co-chairing along with sujit of iit goa and uh, so this is basically to invite you all to think about uh, you know submitting papers um, we should be this is just the first announcement i'm making really uh, so Uh, uh so uh, we'll be getting along with the other proceedings like you know where the proceedings will be uh, published and all that so we will announce in a while uh, but the scope remains very much the same as in the previous editions it's pretty broad so i think uh, you can consider um, i mean there are so many areas uh, so you can consider Uh, submitting papers um, dealing with any of these topics so we have had mathematical and philosophical logic logic in computer science foundations in philosophy of mathematics and the some sciences uh, use of formal logic in areas of theoretical computer science and ai logic and linguistics history of logic indian systems and the relations between logic and other branches of knowledge so as you see it's pretty broad and uh, so i invite you all to uh, the idea today to meet you all is basically to put it into your head the call for papers would be out in a month i guess in a month or two is time but the tentative uh, schedule for uh, i mean deadline would we could safely say would be november uh, beginning so there is time in november beginning of this year so maybe first week of november uh so there is time please uh, think about uh, submitting a paper for this conference i think that's it i had asked uh, requested akil to be here but he had to uh, go somewhere so i think if there are any questions i see sujata is here i think if uh, she would like to add something on behalf of the executive committee if i have missed something no, no, it's fine thank you okay okay yeah so that's it thanks thanks for the time for for accommodating this okay thank you mohadi and there is another announcement actually so i am really pleased to announce that uh, we are going to organize isla this time as well like that is the indian school on logic and its applications and it is going to be the ninth one so there will be two parts of that uh, school the first part will be uh, organized by uh, us uh, at iit kanpur Uh, that will be in virtual mode hopefully and uh, it will be on uh, 16th to 21st may 2022 and uh, the main theme of this uh, school is logic and dualities for the first part and uh, by now we already have our confirmed speakers so first of all we do have professor sujata ghosh from isi chennai professor mohan banerjee from iit kanpur professor nick bezanish billy from university van amsterdam uh, netherlands and professor marcos uh, tressel from university of manchester and also professor amit kubel and uh, two more students animesh uh, rinanze and dipankar maiti also will uh, uh, i mean give some courses uh, during this isla and they are uh, i mean in couple of months uh, or in a month there will be another part of isla i feel that shankhade is already there uh, so if he wants to uh, specify something uh, please uh, uh, tell tell us i think that would be better because 
I don't know. Uh, don't hi, Purvita. Yeah. So we are planning to organize the second part of ISLA. The main theme would be the intersections of logic and computer science. We have some topics in mind. Uh, we are uh, currently checking with the probable speakers. Uh, we will uh, let out more details as soon as we uh, have some confirmations. Thank you so much, Shankada. So we are going to publish our official, official website very soon and you will get all the uh, uh, details there. And I hope to see some of you there in that uh, program. Uh, I think that's it for that, Isla. And also another announcement is that at the end of the uh, session for today, we are going to, uh, actually we have a plan to have a informal discussion or ADDA. So please be there if you really would like to uh, join for that informal session. So Monidipadi, it's already over. Yes, of course. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, no, we are very happy to have uh, Professor Amita Chatterjee for the next, next uh, speaker of the next session. Uh, she's an eminent personality in philosophy of science. She is a logician and professor emeritus at the School of Cognitive Science, Tadapur University. And uh, she has been the vice, uh, the first vice chancellor of Presidency University, second vice president of the Division for Logic, Methodology and Philosophy of Science and Technology. She has been the editor of several uh, academic journals, for example, uh, Philosophy East and West, Journal of Indian Council of Philosophical Research. Um, in 2019, a two volume first shift in her honor uh, named Mind and Cognition and Interdisciplinary Sharing has been published. Uh, we are very happy to have her with us today. I request Professor Chatterjee to deliver her talk. Thank you, Monidipa, uh, for your introduction. And uh, it's really a pleasure uh, to be able to talk before you. But uh, uh, you know that um, when Shora approached me, I said that 